Hi, everybody. Welcome to our Arts Health Day 2013. My name is Jessica Holland. I am the executive director of an arts service organization called C4 Atlanta. Um, this day is made possible by uh, a couple of different efforts from several different groups. So um, we have C4 Atlanta, Wonder Root, and Alternate Roots producing this event for the arts community in Atlanta. And a special thanks to the City of Atlanta Office of Cultural Affairs for the Power to Give program, which made this whole day possible. We raised funds from individual donors and then got a match from the city. And that's how we paid for those biometric screenings. So just a thank you to all who gave. Um, we can't do this without support from individuals. Um, I am going to uh, hand it over to Jim Brown of the Actors Fund. Um, I've actually seen Jim um, talk about um, this particular topic. He'll be um, touching on uh, patient protection in the Affordable Health Care Act, also known as Obamacare. Um, and it's, a, it, it's so informative, so important, and I invited Jim to come back because back to Atlanta because I really, really want this information out there. So welcome, and uh, without further ado, Jim Brown from the Actors Fund. Thank you, Jim. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I should first say that uh, I don't call it Obamacare. I call it Obamacares with an S at the end of it. Uh, my name is Jim Brown, but my real name is James Brown. I say Jim Brown because if I say James Brown, I have to go, ow, or I have to make some sort of sound that people want when they hear the name James Brown. I'm the National Director of Health Insurance, uh, at Health Insurance Resources at the Actors Fund. The Actors Fund is a national human services organization that works with people in the performing arts and the entertainment industry. We're involved in housing, uh, affordable housing. Uh, we're involved in uh, something called an actor's work program, which attempts to get um, uh, uh, lucrative uh, jobs for people who are pursuing uh, a career in the, in the performing arts. Um, we do health services. We have a free clinic, the only full-time free clinic in, in Manhattan. Uh, and we work in social services. So we have about uh, 20 social workers who give programs in substance abuse, uh, HIV, AIDS, uh, anxiety, and a number of other areas. Uh, my part of it uh, began in 1998. We got a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts uh, to set up a center uh, that would educate artists, not just performing artists and people in entertainment, but visual artists and craftspeople as well, uh, regarding health insurance. And the reason for this is the National Endowment of the Arts had done a study in which they found out that if you are an artist in the United States, you're more than twice as likely to be uninsured as the general population. So what that means is between 30-33% of all artists in the United States have absolutely no health insurance at all. Another 15-20% to 20 are underinsured, meaning they have high, very high deductible policies, five $10,000. So the idea was to bring the information, uh, artists in every state. Uh, we set up a website, that's ahirc.org, A-H-I-R-C.org, uh, and it's gone through about six or seven iterations now, but you might want to take a, a, a look at that. We began telephone counseling for people around the country. Uh, we have an 800 number, and all this information you can find out at the ahirc.org site. Um, and um, what else have we done? Seminars uh, in about, uh, I think, a little over 100 cities in the United States in the past uh, uh, 12 years. So, uh, and that's one of these cities, Atlanta, which um, uh, I absolutely uh, love and saw for the first time when, as Jessica said, I gave a, a talk at a lovely place called Push Push uh, a Theater, and it was just a, a terrific audience. And I'm hoping to replicate uh, that experience here insofar as that we had, as I recall, Jessica, a very vocal audience, okay, which I like. Uh, and so uh, there's no point in you keeping your questions to the end. You're going to forget what you wanted to ask, okay? So just raise your hand if some issue comes up that you want to discuss, okay? And we'll try to spend a few minutes on that 
before we get back on, on the, the, in, in the direction that will, that will get us to the end of, of what we want to do. I'd like to accomplish two things here today. One is I'd like all of you to have really a good, sharp understanding about what the Affordable Care Act is, what's coming with it, and what's coming with it despite um, local politics, okay? Um, it, there was a time when I would give talks on this in which I would have to get involved with debates regarding the Affordable Care Act, but that's over, okay? This is the law of the land now. It's a program, the way Medicare is a program or Social Security is a program, so that, that, that's over, okay? So what we're interested in now, I believe, is learning how this works, right? I can guarantee you that after the 30 or 40 minutes that we'll spend on that, you will know more than 98% of Americans about what's actually coming, because people just generally don't know what, what all of this is about, okay? Then, the second part of it is, uh, I'd like to, for those in the room here who live in the state of Georgia, I'd like to give you some guidelines uh, about getting health insurance and health care in Georgia, and sometimes specifically in Atlanta, okay? And that's one of the handouts that you have there. There are three handouts. One of them is a booklet we created at the Actors Fund called Every Artist Insured. We decided to go right for our dream wish fulfillment right there on the cover, Every Artist Insured. Uh, and for anyone who is um, uh, accessing this on, on the internet, um, this booklet is, eligible, is, is available in PDF form on the first page on the lower right of the AHIRC, A -H -I -R -C, dot org site. Okay, so you can just click on that and this entire booklet that we're looking at here uh, is there and can be printed out in color exactly like this if you'd like to have copies and distribute them if you're representing groups. Um, so we'll be referring to that booklet. Uh, in addition, we have uh, a handout, and I'm about to say the two most frightening words in the English language, and I think you'll agree with me. I consider it two words. You might consider it one. PowerPoint. <laughs> okay, it's a frightening, terrifying word <laughs> that generally clears the room, okay? These are PowerPoint slides, all right, for a small PowerPoint uh, 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 presentation. And actually, I'll be following uh, this as we go through. For those uh, on the webinar, uh, I'll be reading it out so you'll be able to follow it uh, as well. And at the end of this, I will give uh, my email address if you would like that PowerPoint, okay, to show, to look over at home or to show to any group or use in any uh, legal way that you, that you wish. Uh, I'll send it to you and you can do that, okay? And then the third sheet is uh, Georgia. Yes. I have some right here. So, oh, thank you. And there are three sheets there. A, does anybody else not have them? So we have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And there should be uh, should be plenty there. And what did you say the PowerPoint presentation is? What uh, the PowerPoint? Uh, you, I'm going to and let me give you it now. Why why wait to the end? Right? Uh, I, I it, it's not a, a mysterious thing. It's kind of a suspense thing. I try to keep you by. By waiting, you have to wait for my email <laughs> email address. Obviously, it didn't work. Uh, so my email address is this. It's the letter J, Brown, B-R-O-W-N, at Actors Fund, as one word, A-C-T-O-R-S, F as in Frank, U-N-D, dot org. So J Brown at actorsfund.org, okay? Uh, you send that to me, I'll get it right out to you. Within 24 hours, you'll, you'll have the, uh, the, the PowerPoint, okay? Now, I should also mention uh, this to you, um, my telephone number at the Actors Fund, okay? And this is important because um, uh, I should give you just a little bit of my background. Um, when I graduated from college, I went over to Sardinia to make spaghetti westerns. I was an actor in spaghetti westerns, and the only reason for that is that I was six foot three and weighed 142 pounds. So I was the perfect lanky cowboy. 
But when they brought me over, it turned out that I couldn't act at all, and I cannot, all right? So, but they had me there. So in every movie I was in, I was the first person who was killed. I was killed within five minutes. I was the guy who the sheriff walked into the bar. I said, back off, lawman, and he shot me. And then I would work on other aspects of the film, okay? Uh, I taught at NYU, New York University, for 15 years in the drama department in the School of, of the Arts. I had um, some famous students, Alec Baldwin. I had Adam Sandler as a student, who I famously told that his uh, humor was infantile. <laughs> and, I, and I thought this was a criticism. Apparently, this was a, a, his go-ahead to have a, uh, a, a, a long career. Uh, I left teaching to work for um, the uh, American Red Cross, then International Red Cross overseas in disaster areas, and I did that for several years. Uh, got back to the United States, was broke, and a friend of mine was working for the Aetna Insurance Company, and he said, Jim, there is gold in them Nar Hills in, in, in health insurance. And so I worked in health insurance for 10 years uh, for Aetna and Empire Blue Cross Blue, Field, Blue Shield. And then I became a regulator for health insurance for the state of New Jersey. I, I go, and then went worked for the Actors Fund. But I go through that um, to tell you I know a great deal about health insurance. But I may be the only health insurance person you hear talk or you speak to in your life who isn't trying to sell you something, okay? I don't know if any of you are familiar with the singer John Prine, but John Prine has a line in one of his songs, every, every one of my best friends turned out to be insurance salesmen, okay? <laughs> and I think we've, we've, all, we've all been through that experience. So um, let me give you my number at the Actors Fund is 212-221-7365. Extension 265. So 212-221-7300, extension 265. Okay? And um, if you call me, all right, and this is true for anybody listening to this on the webinar over the internet, that's what we're set up to do. We have professional insurance people at the Actors Fund. We have social workers who have been trained in health insurance. You call us, and we will help you find affordable options if affordable options exist, affordable options is a little bit like an oxymoron, like Larry King Live or something like that, okay? <laughs> but we will help, we will try to help you uh, find uh, those options, okay? So feel free to call us and you are our clients when, again, we're not selling anything at all. All the money from the, for the Actors Fund comes from uh, grants, from uh, not, not for profits, okay? So let's begin. Uh, with the Affordable Care Act, and I'm going to have to take off my glasses now because I, I don't know if any of you have this. I can see, per, read perfectly without glasses, okay? I just need glasses to see anything beyond 10, you have the same thing, 10 or 15, 10 or 15 feet. So I, I, I almost don't like to do this because people tell me it's quite disturbing when I look at them without my glasses. Since I can't see you at all, I can just see some uh, blurry thing there, but I will see your, your, your hand go up, Okay. So what's already happened uh, since uh, March 2010 uh, in uh, the Affordable Care Act? Well, children under the age of 19, and I'm referring now to the PowerPoint here, but again, for the people who are on the webinar, all of this and all of the information that I give you here, unless I lapse into stories about my fascinating childhood in the Bronx, and it was, it was a fascinating childhood, uh, unless I do that, everything I talk about is in this uh, green booklet here, okay, that you can download. So children under the age of 19 with pre-existing conditions can't be denied coverage. I don't know why it took us this long to come to that, but that's the case now. So no, no, one, uh, no child under the age of 19 can be denied uh, uh, health insurance. Young adults up to the age of 26 can stay on or enroll in their parents' coverage. <coughs> This is extremely important, okay, uh, particularly in the arts, because what it does is it allows people when they're very, very young And so you don't have to worry about health insurance. You don't have to worry about, your parents don't have to worry about if you, this depends upon whether your parents have health insurance, of course. So the significant thing here 
is that you're able to go on the parent's insurance as just another child. Many states passed laws. By the way, Utah was the first state to pass a law like this that extended insurance to children, not just to children, but to young adults to the age of 26 years old. And the reason for that is that uh, young Mormon men go out and, uh, and are as missionaries. Okay, so they, in the state of Utah, they extended it to age 26. Other states have extended it to age 29. The problem is you would have to pay the full cost for the insurance. Here, it's just another child in the family, okay, on the insurance. So this is very significant. Insurers can't retroactively cancel the policies of people who are sick. This is called rescission in the insurance business. And what... Time when you're going to need an operation that's going to cost $40,000. The insurance company goes into your file with a fine tooth comb and make sure that nothing in there is incorrect. Because if they find something incorrect, for example, if you forgot to put that you had asthma or there's some anomaly that exists in your file, what do they do? They drop your coverage. But notice they have accepted your coverage for those 12 or 14, uh, your premiums for those 12 or 14 years. And at the moment when there's a high payout, your insurance is dropped. Okay, this is a nasty bit of business. And this has been stopped now with the Affordable Care Act. Okay, that's what rescission is. Uh, insurers can impose lifetime uh, limits on medical benefits. Uh, what this means, uh, all of you who have an insurance uh, policy, that's one of the numbers on the schedule of benefits, okay? The lifetime payout. And usually the lifetime payout, it, actually not usually, it can any, be anywhere from $50,000 over the course of your lifetime to $5 million, or in fact all HMOs in the United States are required to have no limit on that payout. Now, what does that mean? Well, the average, let's say, is $1.5 million. So it'll say the insurer over the course of your lifetime will pay $1.5 million. And you say, that's a lot of money. How could I possibly reach $1.5 million? Okay, well, one of the most famous stories, of course, in, in, at least in, in the entertainment world, is Christopher Reeve, who had a, 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 obviously a serious head injury, and he, his policy uh, was used up, I believe, in 17 months, the $1.5 million in the policy, okay? <clears throat> Any policy now sold in the United States has no lifetime limit on it. You follow me? Okay? So you, so you cannot be dropped at the point you reach uh, uh, an amount. Uh, all new plans must cover certain preventive services, mammograms, tetanus, and that just makes sense, okay? The earlier on that you discover a problem, uh, uh, the, the better your chances are of, of being healed, and also the less cost it is to treat that, that problem. So the next one here is 2010, uninsured people with pre-existing conditions may be eligible for coverage through PCIP. Uh, those on the webinar, every state has a PCIP plan, okay? Just put the, the letters PCIP into Google or Bing or whatever you use, okay? And it'll come up, uh, either your state's PCIP plan or the federal plan. Georgia does not have its own plan. It uses the federal plan, which is fine, okay? And I'm going to talk about that when we talk about Georgia. I'm going to direct you to where to find that plan. Uh, but I what I'll tell you now about that PCI plan is you have to be uninsured for six months in order to get it, and this is part of uh, uh, the Affordable Care Act, and you have to have a pre-existing condition. So weirdly, oppositely, in order to get this, you have to have a pre-existing condition. And I remember I was with a group of about 150 people giving a talk like this, and I had actually given out the sheet of the pre-existing conditions. And there was a fellow up around, up in that area there, and he was pouring over the conditions, and then suddenly he went, woohoo! <laughs> and, I, and I said, what, what is that? And he says, I've got one, severe psoriasis. And it was an odd moment that someone was <laughs> pleased to have a pre-existing condition, but he was thrilled because he was able to get the, the plan, which would have been, in, in his state, 
about $900 less than the previous uh, uh, pre-existing condition risk plan that they had before. So it, it worked for him. Twenty fourteen, the term pre-existing. Con I always love the term pre-existing condition too because it sounded like existentialism one hundred and one in college. You know, <laughs> today we're going to discuss the pre-existing condition. You know, it's kind of like pre-owned cars. You know, in, in, instead of used cars. But in any way, it's a it's gone away. It, you won't be denied insurance anymore for any pre-existing condition. Most people will be mandated to have coverage or pay a penalty. If you look in your booklets here, you'll see uh, the different groups that are uh, exempt from that. I'll tell you a few of them. <coughs> Native Americans are exempt because they have their own health care system. Anyone making less than $8,000 a year is exempt from having uh, uh, health insurance. Uh, anyone who... Um, Anyone, actually, anyone who makes less than 9600 they wouldn't have to put it, they wouldn't have to uh, file taxes. So if you don't have, have to file taxes, you don't have to have a plan. And that's kind of a tricky one, because how are they going to find out if you have a plan or not? It's through the IRS. Okay, that's how they're going to, that's the mechanism that's going to find out that if people have followed the mandate, Okay. New insurance marketplaces called exchanges will offer uh, insurance to those who don't get it elsewhere. In November of the past year, your governor... ...put away, it doesn't matter because the federal government is going to set it up for you. Okay? Uh, it's, it's, well, I shouldn't say it doesn't matter. It, it matters greatly. It's an unfortunate thing insofar as your state will not have a say in how it's set up. And you, you know who your people are. You know what you need. You know who your people are. <coughs> Excuse me. You won't have a say in how it's set up. The federal government is simply going to, uh, to do that. In any event, it'll still be there. The exchange will still be there. And what is the exchange? It's a marketplace where you'll go to get health insurance. And I'm going to describe in a moment in detail the way that is going to work or how it's meant to uh, uh, work. Now, here's something critical. Subsidies. person households, the amount will go up. But for individuals uh, with income less than 40% of the federal poverty level, <coughs> that amount now is already over $44,000. It's 43 here. It goes up every year, the federal poverty. Does everybody know what the federal poverty level is? The FPL, you see it in the newspapers all the time. It's a formula invented uh, in 1964, I believe, okay, and um, it's really a, a way to determine whether an individual or a family is living in poverty in the United States. Now, that formula is used uh, everywhere in the 48 contiguous states, the same one, and there's a different formula, slightly different formula, used for Hawaii and Alaska, okay? Now, I used to say this. I'm going to tell you what I used to say and why I don't say it. Not a clue, okay? We took geography, but you've seen that New Yorker cartoon, I think, where it's, you know, it's, it's New York, then there's New Jersey, then there's Chicago, then there's Las Vegas, and then there's California for, for, for a, uh, a New Yorker. Well, the federal poverty level, the FPL, as I say, is the same in all 48 states, but it's the same everywhere. was some place opposite, in some terrible way, I guess, than the center of Manhattan. Well, of course, somebody in the audience raised their hand, and they said, 
By the way, I'm from the backwoods of Arkansas. And it's actually a very, <laughs> a very nice place. And it's not that cheap to live there. Okay, at least if you're an individual. Um, you are officially poor in the United States if last year you made less than a little under $12,000. Okay? So if you made a under a little less than $12,000, you're officially poor. If you made more than that, welcome to the middle class. Okay? So... Almost all social programs, almost all social programs in the United States are based on the FPL. And what you'll see is... ...gradations with Medicaid, depending upon you're a pre pregnant woman or you're blind or what your situation is. But I would say Georgia is somewhere in the area of maybe 63% 60, of the federal poverty level in order to get Medicaid, and then going up higher for people in different situations, okay? So that's what the FPL is. $34,000. As of January... I, I say January 1st, 2014, but this goes into effect really on October 1st of this year because on October 1st, you are going to begin to apply for these insurances. Okay, so... premium you're going to have to pay for that insurance, not free, you're going to have to pay a premium for it, okay? How much copay you'll have to pay at the doctor's office, okay? What's the limit of your out-of-pocket costs, what they will be, okay? And all of these things you will know up front. This is really one of the first times we've had something like this. You're having a real sense of what your financial liability is going to be with your health insurance, okay? Now, what are you buying? What's the product of the Affordable Care Act? It's an essential set of benefits. I've listed in this next slide here some of them, and for those on the webinar, webinar what I've listed, all plans have to have the essential benefits, ambulatory care, emergency care and hospitalization, maternity and newborn care, mental health and substance abuse, prescription it on the most popular small business plan sold in that state. Okay? So it's going to be a good plan. So whatever the most popular small business plan, it's going to be a good plan. It's going to be a good plan in Georgia. Um, and what does that mean that's going to be a good plan? Okay? under 400% of the federal poverty level who will be paying less for it because of subsidies. Do you follow me on this? That is, that is, on the exchange, if they're going to sell it on the exchange and you get a subsidy, they must include that it'll be comprehensive health insurance. Will you be able to buy a plan that is not comprehensive? Yes, you will, because insurers will be selling insurance products that are off the exchange. You follow me here? So you can buy something else if you want to, and who will be buying those? People making over $40,000 a year. You follow me? Because they're not going to get a subsidy anyway, right? And they can buy, they'll just... This is working. It can be a little bit tricky. Yes. That's a great question. It's the, it's the number that's on the line of the first page of your tax.
I'm at the, on the bottom of the first page. That's the number that you're looking at for all of these things. Okay, there's only one program in the United States that uses uh, an income which is fully adjusted income from, for example, medical costs can be taken off, all sorts of other things, and that's medical. from their income, and then their income can go below the amount, amount that makes them eligible. Okay? Yes? So, I don't know if this question is possible, but if you are, um, if you are not eligible, you Remember, it's what, what will be defined as poverty for this will be 133, actually 138 percent of the federal poverty level. So it's about thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars a year. Because Medicaid, now I do not know if you are going to do that in your to the extended Medicaid program. Now, you guys, I believe, have a Republican governor. The chances are that, that, that your governor may not do that, okay? Uh, I know, though, Kasich in Ohio The federal government is going to extend the eligibility for, for Medicaid and then pay the full cost for a number of years. So the states won't have to pay. The federal government is going to have to pay those costs, okay? So it's, it's you know, it's, it, it's crazy not to accept it. It's just it, crazy. But it's... But One hundred thirty percent. We're looking from that to four hundred percent, and I'm going to show you in a detailed way in a moment how that's going to work. Okay, I think I think you'll you'll get that, and I think there was a question. Probably explain it, but I'm not going to catch it. I have had health insurance for several years because it was a Medicaid program, and I Right, you're going to be su you're going to be subsidized to, to to be able to do it. And remember, if it's going to cost you more than uh, eight percent of your income, you don't have to have it. If you can't find a, a plan that that's less than eight. You follow me? Yeah, follow. So that's, and of course, what are we talking about here? We're talking about the way we intend this to work, correct? Do you have a booklet? And now you can call me and say, what a son of a, you know, <laughs> okay. All, All right. That's correct. And if you make between that and forty-four thousand dollars a year, you'll be eligible. It's just been so easy. Okay. Yes. <laughs> That's such a great question. Okay, part of the law is every state will have something called navigators and assisters. Do it. 
okay? And there's a huge amount of money uh, for those people, the navigator organizations, and then what are going to be called uh, in-person assisters who will show you how to do about that, how to do that, okay? We're hoping... No, no, it, it, it doesn't affect you at all. I hope you'll stay. Have, I believe, been saved something like $7.2 billion since the start of the Affordable Care Act. And where did it come from? It's the donut hole, the, the, the point at which... ...to pay for a whole slew of um, preventive medicine testing. Okay, so you're, you're, you're fine the way you are. And it don't, uh, Affordable Care Act didn't, didn't affect you at all. Okay, yeah. Okay, for those of you on the webinar uh, and have, have brought up the booklet, if you did that, um, it's page five on the booklet that's on our site there. And for those of you who have the green booklet here, we're referring to page. Four, four types of plans, actually five, and I'll tell you the, the fifth one in a moment, but generally four types of plans. Um, a bronze plan, a silver plan, a gold plan, and a platinum plan. In a meeting in Washington when it was first around, uh, announced, and honestly, I raised my hand and I said, I would like the, ti the titanium plan, the one where you pay, you pay for everything, okay? But they haven't developed the titanium plan. Uh, the insurer pays 70, you pay 30. In the gold, the insurer pays 80, you pay 20%. And in the platinum, the insurer pays 90% and you pay 10%, okay? Which is... South Jersey Cultural Council several years ago to give a talk to that organization. And the talk, I, I agreed to do it, and then they said the talk is in a casino in Atlantic City. And I'm dreading it. Talk, it's hard enough. People are pulling the slot machines, and it hits me that Las Vegas is the perfect place to have a talk on health insurance. And why... ...health insurance on, our model, is gambling. Right? Is gambling. How lucky do you feel this year, okay? And how well have you calculated, okay, how much you're going to... ...process you go through in deciding whether you're going to get the bronze or the, or the platinum plan.
How lucky am I this year? How healthy am I? Do I expect to be in the hospital? Still going to be put, and hopefully these assisters will be able to help you sort of make a decision about that, you know, where, where you are. The plan that is traditional American health insurance before. Insurance used to work before the uh, uh, early 90s and HMOs came in. There's a fifth plan, and that's a ca so-called catastrophic or high deductible plan, but you have to be uh, you, 30 years old. It's going to be $5,990, okay, that you'll pay out of pocket before your insurance will kick in at 100%. So that's another... What's that? Yeah, because they're, they're just betting on the fact that they don't go, they don't go to the hospital anytime. They never go to the doctor, never go to the hospital. I'm a good example of that. My freshman year of college, I was 18 years. Until in those years, I always had health insurance. I made almost no use of the American healthcare system. I just didn't. I was lucky. A couple of years, I had the flu or something, but I was just that was it. I w I was the insurance company's perfect. The cost of health insurance, someone 22 years old in Atlanta, Georgia, can probably get a decent plan for $155 a month, maybe even less than that, okay? I'm 63, that plan I can guarantee... to the age of 40, and then after the age of 40, they paid less. And they always said the reason was because women uh, can uh, uh, go into childbirth. What do you think the real reason women pay more for men, for health insurance for men? Usage. That's it. Perfect. Who said that? Usage. That's right. <laughs> Completely. Okay. Women, women go to the doctor so much often than men do. And, and some... So, yeah, that, that, that's the reason for it. Okay. So, anyway, you, you get a sense of this looking at it, and hopefully those of you on the webinar can, can take a look at uh, uh, that, that item as well. Um, cost sharing. Plans must limit enrollees out-of-pocket expenses. This is so significant that it's astonishing, really, that this is in the law. Plans must limit enrollees out-of-pocket expenses, including the deductible. Why is that significant? It means this. No one. No one in the United States will any longer have bills of
okay? That is gone because your liability will be, and it's still high, obviously, right? $5,990 and $11,000, but that's it. Uh, 2008, the definition of the middle class in the United States is you have people uh, or places to borrow money from. That's it. Okay? <laughs> you, you can borrow money. Ways where 47% of all bankruptcies in the United States, the major debt was medical. The thing that they didn't point out in that study is 70% of those people had health insurance. They just had bad health insurance, okay, that ran out, that, did, that didn't cover the... It does include a deductible, okay? I wanted to say something to you now about these costs, okay? I'm going to put my glasses on for this. Um, I'm working uh, in health insurance. I would negotiate rates with large doctors groups in Manhattan. And there was one gastroenterological group. There was about 12 doctors in it. And some of you know that every procedure that takes place has what's called a CPT code. It's a code that's built on, okay? And I went in to talk to the head doctor. thing we do in this office. Okay, so I said, what's the code? And he gives it to me, and I look down, and I see that we're paying $892 for this code. And I have a feeling it's pretty low, and I'm not going to get this guy to join his group. But I say to him, can you just tell me what you charge for that? And he says, we charge $7,530. And I say to him, we charge $800. We, we, we give $892 for that. And he said to me, you know, that's not bad. Now, what's happening there? The charge is an illusion. It's just some wild, crazy thing, right, that's been, that's been brought up, okay? The uninsured pay that amount. Nobody else does. The insurers have negotiated rates. Medicaid, Medicare has a negotiated rate. So... Understand that, okay, when you're confronted with these types of things, particularly if you're, you're uninsured. Well, I don't have that much time, do I? And I have so much to say. I didn't realize, and I've gone on like this. And so I'm going to go just quickly through this here. And then what I'm going to do is, you have that second sheet on Georgia. Um, uh, is it possible for people to come up? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over to page, page six in this booklet, okay? In this green booklet, page six. And there it shows you, okay? There's a chart there. So it has the... person can pay out of pocket is 2% of their income. 133 to 150%, 3 to 4%, 150 to 200%, 4 do you see how this works? It's a sliding scale. So you're making $21,000 a year, and the limit you're going to and 200% of the federal poverty level, okay, so you're making between 14 and 28 and, and a 
14 and uh, let's say 13, 26 thousand uh, dollars. For a person, your limit will be 1,983 dollars. your income, so that's subsidized, and the second way is your out-of-pocket costs, because once you reach those out-of-pocket costs, the insurance kicks in at 100%, and there's no more out of that, any questions you're going to ask me? Uh, we went. We already went through the Medicaid, and the final thing I want to talk about is the small business tax credit. Okay, if any of you, any of you, run a theater, a dance, the definition in order to get that subsidy, and if you look on page, <coughs> excuse me, nine of the booklet, businesses with fewer than 25 full-time equivalent now, to receive the credit, the employer must offer a group health plan and pay at least 50% of the premium. The credit is equal to a percentage of what the employer pays. For 2010 to 2013, it is a, as, as a check from the government. If you pay taxes, you're going to get it as a credit. Beginning in 2014, for a not-for-profit, it's going to be 35%, and for a profit, it's going to be 50%. This is... Almost no arts groups in the United States use it, and I would estimate in the past year or, or two, the Actus Fund has reached out to dance organizations around the country. Um, uh, ask me about that, call me. And in the next to last slide is the small business tax credit. It's the place to go to get the form, the 99T, which your tax person would be able to fill that out for you. Okay? Last questions and yes? Uh, a small business for this, okay? There will be other plans on, in the exchange. We'll, all these exchanges will have something called a shop, S H O P. That's where you're going to look for your health insurance as a. Okay? And sole proprietor, I don't know what it is to be a sole proprietor in Georgia, but you probably file a Schedule C with your taxes as a statement of profit and loss, and there may be some other elements as well for you to do that. You, you know better than I do here. Questions? Yes, I remember we're talking about an average amount here, and I said full-time employees. I shouldn't have said that. It's full-time equivalent of employees. So you could have 38 employees, but some of them are part-time. It just has to come to those number of hours that constantly... Thank you for the people on the uh, on the internet on the webinar. Thank you. Thanks.
So, so I'm going to say that.